Reading with your kids. Hola, Nihal, Konnichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Moni Muli Wanji, Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jad Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show in the iHeart Radio app, on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Vera Hiranandandi. She is here to celebrate her middle grade novel, How to Find What You Are Not Looking For. Hey, Vera, how are you? I'm good. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to have you here, and I'm really excited to find out what how to find what you are not looking for is all about. That's great. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to tell you about it. So tell us, <laughs> tell us. Yeah, sure. So um, how to find what you're not looking for is about a 12-year-old girl who lives in Connecticut in 1967, and she's part of a Jewish family. And they run a bakery in town, a Jewish bakery in town. And when her older sister falls in love with an Indian college student, it sort of changes her family and the the boyfriend's family sort of forever because it, it kind of joins them in a way that they haven't been expected to sort of figure out their, their next step in, in life together. And so Ariel, the main character kind of has to confront her own identity differently in a way that she never has and sort of watching her parents, they're not supportive of the relationship and eventually the marriage. Um, And so a lot of things come up for Ariel that she really never had to deal with before. And she's also going through her own um, struggles at school. She has, there's a difficult relationship with a bully at school and she also has some a learning difference that she's trying to figure out. And so a lot of things are going on for her. And this is all set against the backdrop of 1967. Um, So a pretty tumultuous time in the country. And she becomes more aware of things going on around her, um, particularly the Loving versus Virginia Supreme Court ruling, which bans all laws against interracial marriage um, at that time. So the, the couple is sort of influenced by that. Mm -hmm. So that's the the general summary of the story. It certainly was a tumultuous time that I lived through was a kid. It, I, I wasn't aware. Um, I, I probably was aware when that, that, uh, Supreme court ruling came down, but the idea that in my lifetime, it would have been against the law for me to marry a, a person of a different race. Um, where I'm married to, uh, uh, my beautiful wife is originally from Puerto Rico, so we're at least bicultural. I don't, I, it depends on who's talking to, whether or not it's biracial. But it it would be, it's it's really inconceivable for me that there were laws preventing this kind of thing. Sure. And me too. So part of the reason that I wrote this story is because my own parents got married in 1968 and my father is from India and my mom is Jewish American and grew up in New York. Um, And so they met probably in, I guess they met in 1966 maybe, and they got married in 1968. And so I think about, and they got married in Connecticut where they didn't have mm-hmm. um, anti-miscegenation laws there, but there were still 15 states in 1967 that had them. And so if they had fallen in love, like Virginia, for example, they um, if they had fallen in love one year earlier or wanted to get married one year earlier in a different state, what would they have done? Um, would they have left the state? Would they have decided not to get married? Um, And I can't believe that my own parents, not so long ago, would have been in the position of confronting that. So I really wanted to try to shape a story around that time, exploring some of these questions and my own background um, and learning more about my 
my um, Jewish side of the family and my grandparents, my Jewish grandparents were not in support of my parents getting married at first. Mm -hmm. Um, And so sort of figuring out what they felt at that time. Yeah. C- can you share a little bit about what your um your your mom's parents um uh what 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 their reservations were? Sure. Well, my grandfather um came from an orthodox family. He um originally he was born in Poland and his family had to leave because of the pogroms against the Jewish people in Poland and he left before the Holocaust, but of course that was how can you not, you know, how can you have a Jewish identity and not, you know, feel that connection and that sort of kind of dark shadow hanging over um, a part of your identity that you'll always be connected to. So, so he, he was, he was carrying that. And my, my grandmother was born in this country. She has a Russian um, background. Her family was from Russia but that was what my grandparents were sort of holding with their identity. So they felt like it was their duty as good Jewish parents to have their kids. They had two daughters marry um, Jewish people and continue the sort of Jewish traditions and Jewish lifestyle. And that, that just felt like they would be good Jewish parents thriving as Jews. And so I really understand where, where that came from, you know, and what their conflicts were, um, and objecting to the marriage, you know, they didn't know my father, they just were objecting to it in sort of a theoretical, Mm -hmm. um, way. And, and really at first rejected my mother, you Mm -hmm. know, said, well, then you're out of the family. And that's what in how to find what you're not looking for. Ariel's parents do the same thing to her older sister and Ariel doesn't understand why they would do this. And she also knows, um, Ariel's boyfriend and then husband, um, thinks he's a great guy and why would they possibly feel this way? And so eventually my own grandparents, um, they actually talked to my grandfather. The story is that he talked to a rabbi who said, you know, don't, don't do this. Um, she's your daughter. I know what it says, the text and that you feel like you're following the law, but ultimately she's your daughter and you have to follow what you feel in your heart. And so, um, my grandparents had to kind of think differently and open their mind. And eventually they embraced my father. Um, and my father's side of the family also had their own reservations. Mm -hmm. My father's parents weren't living at the time. Um, so he didn't quite have that pressure from his parents, but they felt like, you know, what are you doing? Why aren't you marrying an Indian Hindu woman? And um, so my parents were sort of pioneers in that way and kind of made both families think differently and open their minds and, um, and kind of let some of those things go. Yeah. I'm really happy that you're sharing that with us because I think a I think we're living in a time right now where people are making really snap judgments on something. And what you just shared, you know, what your, your grandparents were not so much reacting out of hate or, uh, you know, a, a racism. They were more reacting out of a defensive position. So many of our, our Jewish brothers and sisters were murdered, murdered during the Holocaust. I feel a, 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 a duty to repopulate the, the, the world, you know, um, uh, and, and I, th- I really think it's important for us, for everybody to start thinking, let's take a minute and let's dig deeper into this and see why people may be feeling certain ways. Let's t- have a conversation about what's going on. Um, right. And I think this is something that we really should be talking to our kids about so that they're, they learn to sit down and really discern what's going on and get to the bottom of what's going on and, uh, you know, hopefully move things forward in a way that's, that's just like that rabbi did with your grandfather. Mm-hmm sitting down and saying, hey, this is what's most important, love, and you have to love your daughter. Right. And so that's ultimately what everybody discovered, both fictionally and in real life. But But the thing is, there is also the truth that it wasn't 
always easy. Mm -hmm. And my grandparents still, you know, had feelings of maybe my parents, you know, decided to sort of raise us in a pretty secular way. And I think there was sort of some feelings with my grandparents of maybe even disappointment in that sense. And it wasn't always me, always easy for me to kind of be in the world um, with a biracial and identity with an interfaith family. Um, but like it was sort of all worth it. And, and in the sense that it forced us all to kind of think about things differently. And that's what I'm trying to show with the book through Ariel of, of understanding her own Jewish identity and how she feels about it and how important it is to her and trying to understand what her parents are feeling at the same time being angry at them. And, you know, there is a bias in there. You know, they, they had a reaction to her older sister bringing home a brown man who wasn't Jewish. And so there is that, that part, that racial part of it too. And this is in 1967, you know, during the civil rights era, um, it, over the course of the novel, um, Dr. Martin Luther King gets assassinated. And so there are just a lot of things coming together. And I am trying to show that there's just so much nuance and complexity in these ideas. And Ariel is also understanding that she is Jewish and part of this marginalized community, but at the same time, she is white. That's how she walks around in the world. So there's difficulties that come with her identity and there's privilege that comes with her identity. And so, you know, I was, I was trying to kind of (laughs) wrestle with a lot of different topics with this novel. Well, I mean, the reality of life is that it is complex and messy. And I think too often we try to to make it easy so that we don't have to look at the complexity, that we don't have to think. It's just like, oh, it's, you know, black or white, right or wrong. And the reality is there's there's a big middle ground that we have to help our kids uh, sift through. Sure. And I think I sort of live in that middle ground just with my own identity, you know, Mm -hmm. so that's just the way I've sort of came into the world. Um, And I'm sort of, I'm kind of taking a step back, you know, how did, how did all these things come together um, in that time and, and exploring kind of the, you know, how I, how I came into the world in a way through this fictional story. I'm the Jewish side of my family too more. I'm wondering what the reaction was of your family as, you know, they discover that you're writing this book that is not necessarily biographical, but it's certainly inspired by their story. Sure. Um, they are used to it by now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I sort of did a similar thing with the my last book, The Night Diary, and exploring the Indian side of my family and, and you know, in a different sort of exploration of my family history. And so um, my mother, who I had long conversations with, kind of in in part of the research of this novel, she was just very generous about talking to me. And now I'm an adult, you know, it's two adults talking to each other. Um, I'm a mother now as well. And so you can kind of explore different topics in a way that maybe we couldn't when I was younger or, you know, a child. Um, so there, and they also, you know, there are a lot of things. This is certainly inspired by my parents' decision to get married, but it is not really their story in that sense. Um, it's told from a younger person's point of view and she's observing some of those things that happens, but then of course she has her own story, which is really fictionalized. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting that you uh, choose to write middle grade novels. What is it about this audience that uh, you love uh, writing for? Hmm. I don't know. They ask the best questions on school visits. They really do. It's, it's something about that age group, not only the character, but sort of the, the audience. There's this um, real sense of justice that that a lot of kids have where they, they really are. It's the first time they're seeing the cracks in the world. Often, often, sometimes, I mean, that's not kind of, that is in some ways a a privileged journey to have where that's kind of the natural course, course of things that, you know, age 10, 11, 12, you're starting to see, Oh, maybe the world isn't as 
uh, happy and good as my parents portrayed it, but you might be discovering that earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, that was my journey. I kind of started to realize that for a number of reasons at that age. And I think that it's, um, become a really vivid time that I look back on in my life of, wow, you know, the world is actually a lot more complicated than I thought it was and having these more complex questions for the first time. So I really like portraying a character that's experiencing that and then sort of handing the story over to readers who are also experiencing that. And it, it just, it's so, it's so rich when mm-hmm. I, when I talk to kids that age about what they think. Yeah. Uh, you, there's an interesting quote on your website from Adam Gidwitz. He wrote uh, gorgeously written and deeply. Wonderful author. Yeah. Um, he, he wrote that, you know, the, 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 the book is gorgeously written and deeply moving with a main character you can't help but love. How to find what you're not looking for deals with the hardest act in one's fight for justice, confronting the prejudice of those who are closest to us. What did that make you feel when you when you read that? Um, just at first, I was like, no, 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 I don't deserve a quote like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first reaction. And I admire um, Adam's writing so much and just sort of who he is as an author and how he uses his platform and voice as an author um, and how much respect he has for kids. So um, that was an incredible compliment. Um and I, I hope to just sort of be able to embody that mm-hmm. as much as I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 so much it's so much fun. Uh, you were talking about the, the, the kids asking questions. Um, what's I know for me when I'm in performing at at, at different middle schools and whatnot, there, there are some amazing questions. Some kind of awkward questions too. What's the most profound question you remember a middle grader asking you at one of your visits? Mm. Oh gosh, now you're putting me on the spot. Um, I don't know. I mean, sometimes they ask me, you know, a sort of simple question, like what's, what's the hardest thing about writing Mm -hmm. for you? And I think that um, sometimes it's somebody who it, maybe it's being asked by a kid who who loves writing and sort of maybe sees could they have a future in it and they want to sort of know like what's hard about it because they love it so much. Or sometimes it's from a kid who might be struggling in some way and wants to hear like, is it hard for you is, or is, if you're a published author, is it just easy for you? And that's why you get, you know, sort of are this published author because it's just so easy for you. So I just think it's one of the most um, important questions that I get asked of how I answer it, because I want to share with them that, you know, writing is something that is so important to me and something I've been doing as a kid. Um, but it, it is hard all the time. And, but it's also re- really rewarding, and gratifying just for myself, forgetting about being published or, or sort of getting read by other people in that way. It, it's the way that I process the world and the way that I feel mostly myself in a sense is when I'm fully in my story and kind of in the creative flow of creating a story. Um, but there are so many revisions. I also was, I wasn't the perfect student. Um, I, I don't have great handwriting. I'm, I'm grateful that I can compose on the computer. I'm not the best speller in the world. Spell check is everything to me. So I I just want to show them that it's hard and I'm certainly not a perfect writer by any means. Um, but I've been allowed to, to free myself in this space of creativity Mm -hmm. and that's, um, how I'm able to do this, not sort of striving from some kind of perfection that comes easily to me. You shared earlier with us that you've had a chance in in two different novels to explore the different sides of your family. Is there anything else uh, about your life that you're looking to explore in future novels? Sure. I mean, it's sort of endless. So I think that the um, there are two things that I find that I keep coming back to, certainly characters um, managing multiple identities, whether that's, you know, from an interfaith family or being biracial um, 
or sometimes just being kind of one way on their own by themselves and another way kind of in front of people, that sort of dual personality that we kind of all have. So sort of figuring out who you are in the midst of all of that, that is certainly a theme that I'll, I'll always come back to because I feel it so deeply in my own personal life. Um, and another thing is also being a non-traditional learner. I think that that's something that I dealt with in, in some ways growing up and not in such a, a kind of formal diagnosed way, but I, I definitely think that, you know, there are times where I could be really focused and other times where my attention's really scattered. Um, I, you know, did have some trouble with like handwriting and spelling and things like that. And here I am, you know, a published author. And I felt really frustrated when I was boxed in in certain ways in school of like having to be this kind of cookie cutter way. And then if I didn't succeed, I would feel really bad. And um, I had different kinds of learning experiences. So I had that more cookie cutter way. And then I also went to a a private school when I was younger, where it was super creative. And um, I felt really accepted and really free. And so I could just, and, and very sort of individually um, seen as a, as a student. And my kids also have had some experiences where they, you know, they, my son has some learning differences and, um, and just in different ways uh, where they've had to navigate the world differently as learners. And so I just, I find that I feel really passionate about uh, kids finding their way um, that works best for them. Boy, you just helped me have a flashback. I went to a very um, – my elementary school experience was in a very progressive public school system where any, yeah, anything goes. You want to make a – go make a movie, do whatever it is you want. And from there, I went to a very traditional <laughs> uh, Jesuit Catholic high school uh, where Latin and Greek were required. Mm-hmm. And it's like – so that was quite, yeah. quite an experience. It really is. But I'm really grateful for the, the sort of base of experience I had where I did feel really free and accepted. And I could kind of carry that with me mm-hmm. for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As we were speaking earlier, one of the things I, I thought about is, you know, growing up back in the 60s, I heard, you know, the United States, this melting pot, this beautiful place where everybody comes together. But it really wasn't a melting pot because you had Irish neighborhoods and Italian neighborhoods and black neighborhoods and Spanish neighborhoods. So we all existed together and we pretty much uh, grew up uh, in, in most days. We're being respectful of each other, but there wasn't that kind of melting that happened in the case of your mom and dad and happened in the case of me and my my beautiful wife and other families. What do you think the country is going to look like in a generation or two as interracial, intercultural marriages become more and more the norm? Well, already we're we're sort of – people like me are part of the global majority. I mean, that is what's happening. And, but I think, you know, seeing what happened with my parents and their story, um, I think combining and kind of melting uh, different cultures and racial identity, religious identity together does take a lot of thought and it takes a lot of work. Um, it's not just something you can sort of throw together and expect that everything will be fine. So I think it's sort of respecting what that means, um, respecting other people's differences, and then coming together. There are times where you want to be in a place where you feel like kind of there's a shorthand and you feel really understood within your background and that's okay. And then there's a time where you should be sort of learning about other people's cultures and backgrounds and respecting that. And that's okay too. And kind of combining all of that into one thing. Um, it does take a lot of thought and nuance and respect and, and hopefully we, we, you know, for me, there's like kind of nothing more important Mm -hmm. to try to do in the world, but, um, not, maybe not everybody feels that way. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's going to be interesting how the world moves forward. Hopefully, towards we, we move forward towards 
that ideal that you spoke of, of being respectful and loving and accepting of each other. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I know people are going to want to know where they can go to find out more about how to find what you are not looking for and how to find out more about you. Absolutely. Well, um, the book is available now wherever books are sold. And you can find me at my website on www.virahiranandani.com. Or I am on um, Instagram at Vera Writes, and I'm on Twitter at Vera Hira. We've had a great time speaking to the author of the great new middle grade novel. It's called How to Find What You Are Not Looking For. And our guest has been the author Vera Hiranandani. Hey, Vera, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. Our guest would be Amy Pixton. She is the creator of The Indestructibles, a board book that you won't mind your little ones chomping on. It's a really fun series, and the story behind The Indestructibles is fascinating. If you are a parent, if you are an author, you don't want to miss our conversation with Amy Pixton. That's the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Hey, speaking of authors, if you are an author of a fantastic children's book, you absolutely want to go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the Authors Click Here button at the top of the page. That way you'll be able to find out all of uh, all of the great ways we can help you promote your fantastic book. You can be a guest here on the podcast. Being a guest, it's fun, it's easy, it doesn't cost you a thing. What a great way to tell thousands of people about your book. We also have our Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read Program, which has been a huge help to so many authors. But don't take our word for it. Check out our Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read Testimonials. Let the authors tell you their experiences. And also, how would you like to have your book promoted on a nationwide network of pedestrian billboards? We can help you do that. Check it out. Go check out our promotional packages. You can find it all on our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the Authors Click Here button at the top of the page and scroll on down to whichever service you're interested in. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to start by thanking our guest, Vera Hira Nandani. Please be sure to check out how to find what you are not looking for. I also want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima McCon, Rory Grady, Michael Murphy. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. 